introduction. Um, I am Claire Sullivan, like he said, and um, I love seeing how many people from just a variety of countries are here. Uh, to tell you where I'm at, I'm in the United States, high in the mountains of Colorado. Uh, I'm at 3,100 meters or 10,200 feet, depending on your unit of choice. Um, so greetings, and thank you for taking the time to come. Uh, I'm gonna be speaking today about graphs, um, in particular machine learning enabled by network graphs. And I'm not going to assume any graph knowledge here. So um, I know there are people at different stages in their data science careers and education. So I'm gonna start with kind of a quick overview on graphs. Now, I have to tell you that I was um, going to hopefully do a poll and find out, you know, just who had what experience with graphs. I can't do that because I only have the free version and it only takes 25 participants. And I'm very honored to see that we have so many participants. So unfortunately, we're gonna to have to skip through that. Um, but um, I will tell you that at the very end, I will be providing some links. And one of the links is uh, a GitHub link, which will have all of the slides, the notebooks that I'm showing, et cetera. So um, stick around for that. So we're gonna start just with the basic introduction. What is a graph? Um, but then why might you want to use one in a normal data science workflow? Um, and then what is a graphy problem? I think there's a, there's, you know, a perception that graphs are, you know, what you do with social networks and stuff like that. And hopefully I'll be able to motivate you that it's actually a lot more than that. Um, we'll talk about how to create one and then what do you do when you have it and then how you can get into machine learning with your graphs. So let's just dive right in. Um, we all know about social media with graphs and, you know, we've got this concept of nodes, which are these circles and they're connected to each other with edges or relationships. Those are the lines connecting the circles. So, you, you know, we think about who are our friends or our followers on, you know, pick your favorite social networking site, but it's a lot more than that. Um, so we're gonna talk about some of the terms with, with this and how we can calculate some good stuff. Um, internet routing is another great example of a graph, understanding what network connections are going where. Um, maps and wayfinding, uh, that's, it, that's pretty much how Google works. Is, Google Maps works is with graphs. Uh, recommender systems, now we're starting to get a little further outside of the, the more obvious places. I'll show you a recommender system example in a little bit. Search, all of search with Google is based on this next bullet point, knowledge graphs question answering. These are really hot areas right now in graphs and in natural language processing. So we'll talk about that a little bit as well. Uh, just some terminology here. We've got some terms that we use with graphs such as directed graphs, undirected graphs, weighted graphs. Um, what I'm showing here, I have nodes and relationships and you see that those nodes, they're connected by relationships that don't have an arrow. And what that suggests to us is an undirected graph. An example, <clears throat> of an undirected graph might be something like Facebook. If you're friended with somebody on Facebook, they are friended with you. So that is an undirected graph. Now we compare that to a directed graph where you can see now I've replaced those edges or relationships with arrows. And the arrows indicate the directionality of the relationship. So for instance, this would be like Twitter. Somebody can follow me on Twitter, but I don't have to follow them. If you look at the, the far left of that graph with the blue and the two green nodes, I can see that the blue node is following one of the green nodes, is following the other nodes. I can see that more central green node is following the center node and the center Center node is following them. So again, this is a Twitter-like model. Then we can talk about weighted relationships. So in a weighted relationship, we might be indicating the strength of that relationship. Maybe the larger number indicates the strength. So the strongest relationship here is that central blue node to the upper right blue node. It has a weight of 10. That's really great. Or maybe we do it the other way around and we talk about, well, how long does it take me to drive from one place to another? I see those two nodes are, the two red nodes are connected by a weight of one. So, you know, that's kind of how we can use these different types of graphs. But how would we do math on them? 
So what I'm showing here, and this is gonna kind of be the crux for a lot of machine learning, is we can convert those graphs into a matrix. A matrix of say ones and zeros, or maybe you could replace those ones with what the strength of the relationship is. So I've given each node a label, A through H, or I'm sorry, A through I, and if there is a connection between two nodes, what you see is that there's a one in the column. So for example, that top row, A is connected to C, so I have a one there, whereas um, C is also connected to A. So I look at the, the column and I can see that one relationship there as well. I can see that H is not, uh, well, H has an error in it. H is connected. Ah, H does not have an error in it. Why? Because what I am showing is that this is a directed graph. H does not have an arrow going out of it into another node. So that's why in a directed graph, I don't have any values of one within H. Now, we can talk about several different things with this graph. We can talk about degree. Degree would just be the number of arrows coming in and out of a node. So you can see that A, for instance, has a very high degree. We can further simplify that to in degree or out degree. In degree is how many arrows are coming in, out degree is how many arrows are coming out. And there's all kinds of things that we can calculate based on this, but let's talk about why we care. Why does using graphs potentially augment our existing solutions? I'm gonna talk about two common machine learning problems today and why a graph would do better. So I've created this simple social network here. I have Barack Obama in the middle and the nodes that are connected to, connected to Barack Obama are Michelle Obama, Nancy Pelosi is kind of that small one down about the four or five o'clock position. Um, I, I have uh, Joe Biden in the roughly two o'clock position and I've got Elaine Chow who's uh, Mitch McConnell's wife. Let's assume that there's a relationship between Barack Obama and her. Um, and then I'm gonna have this concept of the importance of nodes. And we'll talk about what that means in a minute. But in this graph, Barack Obama is hugely important because his node is big. It's represented by this big node. And I have medium sized nodes and I have small sized nodes. Now, one of the things that we can do is churn predictions. So we might have a lot of data about each of these characters. And that data is presented as a vector. You know, we've got embeddings and we try to use those embeddings to determine what's the probability of any one of these nodes in the graph churning. Well, that's great. And we can do that and we can come up with a model based on supervised learning. We know that people with this particular vector tend to churn more than people with this other type of vector and that's great. The catch though is if you think about social networking, let's say one of these people decided to churn. The idea around a graph is this idea of homophily, which is that the neighbors in a graph tend to behave similarly to their other neighbors. So for instance, let's say Michelle Obama churned in this graph. Well, we have Sasha and Malia Obama there, and they may say, you know what? I'm not gonna stick around because my mom just churned. Um, Barack Obama can say, you know what? My wife left this platform. So yeah, it's time for me to get out as well. Now. What this has demonstrated is the importance of relationships within this graph. And those relationships within a graph are treated as a first class citizen. Let me show you another example, which would be a recommendation engine problem. Um, <clears throat> so recommendation engines, um, you know, they power so many things like sales, um, whatnot. And I'm gonna give an example here of a mailbox. Now you might say, why am I showing a mailbox? This is actually a real world, world problem that I encountered um, when I was building my house here in Colorado. So I was building a house and a certain uh, hardware store knew I was building a house because they could look at my purchasing patterns and they could say, okay, well, Claire purchased um, a bunch of nails and a bunch of wood. That sounds like Claire's building a house. And they could recommend things to me for building a house, such as a mailbox here. And it makes sense to introduce me to a mailbox because if I'm building a house, I likely am going to need a mailbox at some point. Now here's the kicker though, is that I didn't buy that mailbox or any mailbox and why didn't I? Well, the reason being that there is no mail service where I live. Everything that we do is via post office boxes. However, our local hardware store said, oh, there's a lot of people building houses up here, great. And they actually have a whole row in this hardware store of mailboxes that's collecting dust because nobody here has mail service. 
Um, now, had we added some more information into this data, had we added relationships, for instance, you know, Claire lives in this area here with all of her different neighbors, and none of her neighbors purchased mailboxes. So, you know, maybe, maybe the mailbox isn't the right thing to suggest to Claire. Um, so these are two places where relationships really would help us solve more problems. Okay, but what type of problems? How do you know you have a problem that is graphy? Um, and I use graphy in quotes, that's just kind of my silly made up term. Um, but there's a lot of data that we don't ordinarily think of as being a graphy problem. So I, we're, gonna, um, we're gonna look at this table here. This is you know normal tabular data that we're all used to using. And this is a churn example that you can find on Medium. And again, we talked about the importance of relationships, but let me give you a hint of when to know that you so should suspect you have a graphy problem. A lot of us use SQL. I'm gonna be using a different database today, but you know, think of it like a SQL database, except it happens to be a graph database. Um, in SQL, if we start having to do a bunch of SQL joins, that might indicate that we have a graph. Now SQL joins, as we all know, are slow. And especially if I'm having to join multiple columns on multiple columns within tabular data. One thing I had experimented with a graph database versus a SQL database trying to just do traversal of these two databases. And when I looked at a SQL database, the same join took me a thousand milliseconds and it took me microseconds within the graph database because the graph database is set up to handle those joins and to, and to navigate relationships just for how databases are stored. Now, I'm not a database person. I will tell you that if you're gonna ask me, you know, what the nitty gritty is inside of the database, I'm gonna to have to direct you somewhere else. But just let's data scientists, let's keep in our heads SQL joins and particularly several SQL joins should maybe be a hint that we have a graph problem. So we're gonna engage in will it graph, you know, similar to will it blend for those of you who are familiar with that. And I'm gonna start with one of our classic problems, the MNIST problem. I think everybody who does any sort of, you know, uh, computer vision problem, uh, deep learning, we all look at the MNIST problem, classic problem, will it graph? And the answer is yes. Here, we have turned that image into a graph, okay? Now, you can see here, pixels are related to other pixels, okay? So if I have one pixel that's bright in this image, we might suspect that neighboring pixels would also be bright. So yes, you can absolutely look at MNIST with a graph. Okay, facial recognition, will it graph? Well, yes, it will. Um, let's look at these faces here. I have nodes that you know, represent the outline of a face and the nose and the mouth, and I can connect these points in any number of different ways. The point is that, you know, say my nose, um, my nose is got, you know, it's not going to all of a sudden stop until we get to the bottom of my, my nose. So again, this is the, the Mafali associated with facial recognition. Uh, drug discovery, probably this one's not gonna be a surprise. Yes, it will graph. Um, and here's two examples of that. First, we have um, some sort of molecule on the left. I'm not a chemist. Don't ask me what that molecule is, but I have different atoms connected through different other atoms. I have different strengths of connections. Like I might have double bonds between like my carbon and my oxygen, and those can all be represented in a graph. Next example to the right here, what I have is I have um, a whole bunch of publications on COVID. This is obviously a hot topic. And looking at what were the key words in all of those publications. And so what you see here around coronavirus right in the center, you know, that's obviously an important node. I've got pandemic, viral pneumonia. Now, if I start actually zooming out here, you'll actually see some, um, some medications that you could use. You'll see hydroxychloroquine in this graph if you get in close enough. Um, you'll see corticosteroids. So, you know, looking at where are the important drugs, pharmaceuticals within this graph could be a hint uh, for successful treatments for COVID. Okay, natural language processing. Will it graph? This is a fun one. I really like this one. Um, and the answer, of course, is yes. I, you're probably figuring out the pattern here that all of these will it graphs are going to be yes. Um, here's an example. This is a sentence out of Wikipedia, the first summary sentence for Barack Obama. And what you see, this is um, the dependency graph. So we're looking at what words are dependent on what other words. Okay. And 
you know, here we have central nodes where everything is coming out of, like the word is. Is is considered to be the root, and I, I apologize, this text is super small. Um, but if you look at all of those arrows coming out, it's because is is a very important word, the root of the sentence, the most important verb in the sentence. And then I've got a lot of arrows. I have a high degree associated with the word politician. So we might assume that Barack Hussein and politician are two words that should go together. So yes, natural language processing, absolutely. Here's a fun one, body composition analysis. Absolutely will graph. I didn't know that until I was preparing these slides. So if you look on the left, you can see um, different body shapes um, and they are broken down looking at things on the right, like um, the upper limbs, the lower limbs, the torso, and in general. Um, those words, I apologize, are very small, but you will get a copy of these slides and the link to the reference for this is at the bottom of this slide. So we can see the wrist diameter, the elbow, um, the chest diameter. Now, if I take all of this information, going back to the graph on the left, what we can see is that there's a distinct difference. You could draw this red line to separate which body compositions tend to be associated with uh, a male body type versus a female body type. And I'm, uh, um, you know, I don't, don't ask me if we get outside of the two, uh, you know, this, this bimodal version of gender here, but just looking at body type, those, those separate out rather nicely. Okay, that's all just intro. Let's go into how do I create a graph? Because I know everybody's gonna to wanna to get into this and wanna get started with graph analysis, graph data science, graph-based machine learning. So I'm glad you asked, how did I create a graph? Well, there's a few things that you're gonna typically need. You need a node list, okay? So you're gonna want some sort of list, um, CSVs are a great starting point of your nodes. It helps to have unique identifiers on them. Um, it helps to have properties associated with them if you have them, like the name of the, the node. Um, maybe there's properties like the, you know, if I was talking about states, um, like states in the United States, uh, what's the name of the state? I could have geo-coordinates for the state. Um, like we have a node list, we're also going to have an edge list. And again, edge names will help here. Um, so I'm going to say node one, is connected to node two through some type of relationship. And again, we can add our weights in here. Once we know what that data is, then we're gonna develop a graph model around it. And you know, you can think of those similar SQL models where we've got this table joins to this table to make that other table. This is kind of the same thing with a graph. Um, and I'll show you an example in a minute about why that's important that we do that properly. Um, and then lastly, we just want to figure out where we're going to put it. Now, everything I'm going to show you today, I wanted to let you know, this can be done a variety of different ways. There's a common package in graphs um, or in Python called NetworkX. A lot of people start with NetworkX. Um, there's several different types of graph databases, such as Neo4j. Um, I, I'm going to be using a database today. I personally prefer databases because they scale better. But this is, again, a choice that depends on your infrastructure. Um, this functionality that you have in NetworkX, you also have within Neo4j. Um, I'm going to show you. I'm, I'm going to use Neo4j because one of the reasons is because there's a nice visualization tool so you can see what the graph looks like. There's, there's more intuition that will come from just being able to see a graph. Um, but again, the choice is yours. OK. So this is just an example of node lists and edge lists. And um, one of the starter problems that a lot of people use is Game of Thrones. Now I'm gonna throw out there, there's Game of Thrones spoilers here. So, um, you know, if, if that's gonna bother you, it might be a good idea to log off, catch up on Game of Thrones, and then you can watch the video. Um, but in all seriousness, the Game of Thrones books one through five, somebody went through all of the books and started looking at who had what relationships with whom within these? Who appeared in which books? Um, so the node list is what you see on the upper left. And you can see it's got names and titles, um, male or female cultures, things like this. Um, and then on the lower right, we have the edge list. So we can see, and, and this is actually cut off a, a bit, but we can see the name of the, there's a battle here. Um, and so I have the name of the battle. When did it occur? Uh, who was attacking whom, who was defending. Um, so this is, this is the general idea. You're going to have to have these things ready to go if you're going to start uh, doing graph stuff. Um, you'll note at the bottom of the slide, there's a GitHub repo that gives you this data. I'll also show how, show how you can automatically get it within Neo4j. 
Okay, graph modeling. Now, I'm not expecting you to be able to read this text here, but it's very important as you start setting up your graphs to understand what nodes are going to um, have what kind of relationships with what other nodes. And in my view, the best way to do this is to sit down with a whiteboard and start connecting things. So at the very center, even though it's kind of hard to see here is that kind of um, cyan color node and it's got the label of person. So people are gonna be labeled as the cyan color. I've got dead people, which are kind of 630 on this chart. I've got battles, those are purple. I've got houses in red. Houses are kind of like at about 10, 10 o'clock. I've got knights and kings and all of this stuff. Now you'll notice though, I have people, knights and kings and you could have one person with multiple labels and that's totally fine, totally allowed. Um, and then I have my relationships between them. I've got interacts with, and this is broken down into just kind of an overall interacts with versus interacts in this book, interacts in that book, interacts in another book. Um, we have belonging to house. We've got a whole bunch of different kinds of, of relationships here. And it's always a good idea to try and filter on these things as much as you can. Because when you start dealing with really big graphs, by really big graphs, I'm talking about billions of nodes. I'm talking about tens to hundreds hundreds of billions of relationships. It, it really matters that you can filter through that effectively. Okay, so just really quick, this is what our graph is gonna look like. Um, and in, in just a second, I'll show you some code behind how you can create this graph if you want. Um, we see people, we see this really dense cluster here, um, not quite in the center, but slightly off to the right, just like an inch, there's this red node, it's called Stark, so that's the, how Stark, we've got Freys and Lannisters, we've got, we've got all kinds of people here. This is the entire graph as much as I could get onto the screen. There's actually like um, 2,400 nodes and 16,000 edges or something like this in this graph. So um, your, your visualization, it starts looking like a cat's hairball. Um, so, you know, it also helps with visualization if you can narrow down what you're looking for. Visualizing graphs is an art in and of itself. Okay, what can we calculate this? Well, there's a whole bunch of things that we could look at. We could look at node importance or centrality algorithms. Which nodes matter more to us? Obviously there are characters within Game of Thrones that are more important than other characters. Um, there's several different ways we can measure this. This functionality exists just as functions you can call in Network X, in Neo4j, degree centrality. Let's start with that. Degree centrality means how many, it's just degree, which, which nodes have the highest degree. So in this sample graph, A has the highest degree because it's got a whole bunch of arrows coming in and out. Betweenness centrality, I love betweenness centrality. Just because there's a lot of relationships with A doesn't mean that A is the most important person. Think about an office and you've got the big boss and the big boss, you know, there's a lot of people who wanna talk with the big boss, but do you want anyone, um, do you want everyone to be able to reach out to the big boss and get a meeting? And the answer is no. They have to go through the big boss's admin. Now, the admin may not be the thing, the person with the highest page rank, as we'll discuss in a minute. That admin just might have the highest degree centrality or what we call betweenness centrality. The admin is who you go through to get to the that important node. Um, I was asked, please, could you mention the alternative to Network X again? And yes, it's called Neo4j. Um, and I will show examples with Neo4j at um, coming up here in just a minute. Okay, um, so PageRank, we're all, we're all familiar with PageRank. Larry Page, who, you know, one of the core people within the original Google uh, invented PageRank. And what it does is it looks at how many, how many links are coming into a web page um, versus how many are going out. And you can see here, my nodes are colored based on their page rank. So the larger nodes are colored um, with, or the larger nodes have a higher page rank. So I can see, for instance, my blue node has kind of a medium page rank and that's because of a lot of things, a lot of web pages link into it. Um, maybe they're not very important web pages, but there's a lot of them. But then I see a lot of web pages are linking in only in to that yellow node. The yellow node has only one link out. So the fact that everybody's referring to that yellow node means that the yellow node has the highest page rank here. But you see that red node on the top right, 
that's actually got a bigger page rank than some of these other nodes. Um, it's got a proportionately larger page rank than that blue node if it had more links to it, but it's bigger because that's the only thing that yellow node with the highest page rank links to. So that's how we do page rank. Pathfinding, another great um, thing that we can do in graphs. There's a ton of pathfinding algorithms out there. Pathfinding, that's an art unto itself. But here I'm showing my path between Breckenridge, where I live, and the Denver International Airport. Now, Google is able to tell me how, what's the fastest way to get there through pathfinding because it knows how to weight each of the nodes on the path. So those nodes are given by the little white circles, okay? Um, now you'll see a couple things here. There's two different ways I could get to the Denver Inter International Airport. I could go the loop up top, or I could go the loop on the bottom through that highlighted Alma and Fairplay. So why did Google route me this way? Because I'll tell you, this isn't actually the fastest route. Um, you can see that there's that, um, that red box in the kind of upper right section. That's actually usually the fastest way to get to Denver International Airport. But the problem is it's closed and Google knows it. Um, and so Google routed me up and around. Now, the other thing I'll tell you was that I created this graph during the middle of the week. Because I live in a resort town, everybody's coming up here on the weekends and everybody's going back home at the end of the weekend. And so sometimes what you'll see is that the fastest route is actually to go down through Alma and Fairplay. Um, so that's just Google understanding real time pathfinding with a weighted graph. Um, so node similarity is another thing that we can do. Now this typically requires us turning nodes into vectors and I'm gonna show you how to do that in a minute. It's a, it's a super fascinating thing. So node similarity, you know, we can think of, we've got embeddings and how do we compare them? Well, we can look at Jacquard similarity. How many, how many nodes um, do, think, do two nodes have in common? And that's given by the upper right uh, on the slide. But then, you know, we can think about all kinds of distance metrics like cosine similarity, Euclidean distance. We can look at K nearest neighbors, uh, particularly in an unsupervised context. And that's all possible within a graph. And then I think this is the last thing I wanted to mention, but before um, we get into some actual code here is community detection. Um, actually, I think I'm gonna talk about embeddings first, but community detection, how do I find my people? How do I find my people within a social network? Or, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of work showing how different uh, politicians vote with each other. And like in the United States, it's pretty easy using community detection to separate out Republicans and Democrats. Um, so we could detect whole communities, we can detect sub communities. So sub communities would be things like the blue and the green circle with the whole community being the cyan circle. There's a whole bunch of different ways to do this. Um, they're listed here. Network X does it, Neo4j does it. I'll show it to you. I'll show you in Neo4j how to do it. And then the last thing is graph embeddings. Graph embeddings, there's a whole ton of ways that you can convert a graph to a vector, um, but they tend to fall into two categories, transducive or inductive. Um, transducive means I take the whole graph and I train on that and I create vectors around that. Inductive means I can take my graph and I can update those, uh, as a new node comes in, I can provide an automatic vector to it without having to train the whole graph. Benefit is obvious that I can handle new data as it comes in. The drawback is inductive mechanisms tend to take a lot more time. Um, you know, we could break these down further. Matrix factorization, I showed you that adjacency matrix earlier, great for doing math on, on smaller graphs. But if you consider the fact that every node has you know, a row or a column, that's an, that's an order node squared problem, not our favorite thing to do, so they don't scale well. Um, then we have all kinds of uh, different embedding methods based on random walks. Now, if you think about those of you who've uh, done some NLP before, you might be familiar with word -devec, where we do this skipping around a sentence and moving these little skip grams across the sentence. Great thing. Um, and there is an equivalent within graphs called node to -vec. Um, node to vec does similar skipping around, but there's no sequence of um, things like words. So generally what you're doing is you're doing random walks around a graph to try and say, okay, I walked, I did 10 walks, um, 10 hops, 10 times. So, you know, my vector is going to be based on what nodes did I hit along the way. And then of course, everybody asks about deep learning. There are definitely methods based on neural networks, graph convolutional networks, um, graph neural networks, there's tons of them out there. 
Okay, let's, okay. Um, let's, we're gonna transition now. I'm going to go over, I prepared a Jupyter notebook to kind of look at this stuff. Um, and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna uh, just go through a bit of code, um, exploring that Game of Thrones graph. Now, if you go get the slides, there's discussions here about how to set up your connection to Neo4j. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on that right now, um, but it's in, it's in that uh, Jupyter notebook using the official Python driver for Neo4j. And again, just think of Neo4j as a database. I could be giving a similar talk on SQL or you know, any other database that we might be interested in. It's just gonna be a database for us. Okay, let's do some data science. Now, I told you before that it's usually a good idea to break your graph down into the bits that you care about. Okay, so, because otherwise, if you're dealing with a super huge graph, you don't want to calculate everything on it. You're gonna, you're gonna crash your system. It's just gonna be too much as that graph gets big. So we're gonna come up with, we're gonna narrow down our graph into say people. Okay, so I have a query. Now you'll recognize this, it has, it has very similar context to a lot of Python connectors to uh, different SQL databases. So here I've specified a string that's called a query. And we're gonna be using this thing GDS, which is called the Graph Data Science Library. It's what's built into Neo4j to do all of our fun stuff. Um, like I said, there is an equivalent in Network X, but we're just gonna go straight into the fun stuff. Okay, so GDS, we're gonna create this graph and the name of the graph is gonna be called people. Okay, so we're gonna have all people in the graph. That second thing is specifying which nodes we want. So I want all of the person nodes. Um, and then after that, the third entry there is what edges, what relationships do I want? And I'm just gonna say, I want all of them. And I'm gonna run a query and I can see that I have, um, if you look at the last line here, I've got a node count. So I have 2,166 nodes and 8,160 relationships that came out of this graph. Okay, cool. So let's do some calculations on that. Let's calculate page rank. Okay, so we're gonna look across all people in this graph, across all, every relationship that they might have. We're gonna find who are the most important people. Okay, based on page rank, there's all kinds of other things. Okay, so some of these names make sense here. Tyrion Lannister, Stannis, Tywin Lannister, Varys, but now I'm starting to get into some names. I don't know who Yandri or Ysilla are or anything like that. Um, so, you know, I'm just gonna say, uh, I'm, not get, I'm not buying these results. Well, the reason I'm not buying these results is because we specified every single relationship was gonna be part of this graph called people, okay? Not the best way to go. Really, I am only caring about which people interact with which others. So yeah, oops, I don't recognize some of those characters. So let's make this a little bit more refined. I'm gonna create a new graph and it's gonna be called people interactions. And now I'm gonna look at node types called person and only the relationships called interacts. Now I could break this down by season two, but you can see my relationship count went down. I have 3,907 relationships that we just created this in memory graph on. Okay, now I'm gonna run page rank on that. Now my list starts making more sense here. I recognize most of the names on this list until I start getting a little lower here. So I'm, I'm starting to feel better about this, uh, this calculation here. And I should tell you, any algorithm you're going to run on a graph for data science has a whole, whole ton of special knobs that you can turn. Okay, there are hyperparameters upon hyperparameters in these things. Right now, I'm just showing default hyperparameters, but you know, definitely whatever way you want to run the graph is, um, you know, whether it's a network X, whether it's a Neo4j, whether it's in something else, you definitely need to spend some time on those hyperparameters. Okay, cool. Now I've got these page rank things, like you could see here, page rank equals, you know, whatever it equals. Um, that just output it to the screen, but you know, someday I'm probably gonna wanna use that information somewhere other than just having it sitting there in my head. So what we can do is we can write that value to the nodes themselves, because I'll tell you, we're gonna do some calculations coming up here and, you know, I don't wanna sift through all of these names that I've never heard of before. So, so we're gonna write it to the graph. It's just this uh, page rank dot write um, interaction. You can see a few hyperparameters here. Um, that's all well and good. Um, you get some information about how that write went, um, you know, how long it took and how many records were written. Okay, cool. 
So I talked before about node similarity. How do I find which characters, say, in this graph are more similar to which other ones? Again, built into most uh, graph libraries. I'm going to show it in GDS, Graph Data Science Library. So we're going to just output to the screen, which is given by that call GDS node similarity stream. Stream means go to the screen. Um, and I'm just going to return who's most similar to who. So at the very top, I see that Cersei Lannister and Joffrey Baratheon have a high similarity. Makes sense if you know the story. And then I see Joffrey Baratheon and Gregor Clegane. Um, it's repeated there. Um, they have uh, the, you can get rid of duplicates in here if you want. But, you know, again, that makes sense. Um, Jamie Lannister, Joffrey Baratheon, Jamie Lannister, Cersei, uh, again, all of that makes some sense here. Okay. But didn't I say that weighted graphs were cool? If you can create a weighted graph, awesome. Always do it. Um, so I haven't created a weighted graph right now, but there's actually weights within this data. So we're going to create a new in memory graph. Okay, this looks a little more complicated. Don't worry, it's not that bad. Um, it's going to be called GOT weighted interaction. So again, we're looking at people interacting with other people. But if you get in and you look at the actual properties of those relationships, there is a property called weight in there. Okay, so we're going to use that weight. We're going to tell it there's a default value because, you know, sometimes as we all know, as data scientists, 90% of the job is being a data janitor. Okay, we have to clean our data, clean our data, clean our data. So not all of these edges have weights, so we want to give a default value wherever we can. Okay, so um, now we're going to do, we're going to detect some communities based on that weighted graph. Again, community detection is one of those that really can benefit by using the weights, which, which relationships are more important than which other relationships. So we're gonna use what we call Louvain, uh, Louvain community detection. Um, and it's, it's a mathematical thing. I don't have time to go through the math on it. There's plenty of resources out there. Um, Wikipedia is your friend on this one. Um, but let's just do Louvain community detection. It's probably one of the most common types. Um, and we're just going to stream to the screen what the uh, what the detected communities are. And again, you know, I'm getting names here that I don't really know that well. I can see, you know, you're going to get this integer for your community ID. Um, and I can see in here that community ID 13 has Asha Greyjoy and Balon Greyjoy. Okay, that kind of makes sense. I don't know a lot. Oh, Aaron Greyjoy. Okay, I got Greyjoys in community 13. Um, all right, let's, let's try to look at who the major characters are um, and what communities that they're in. So this is where it mattered that I wrote the page rank to the nodes because I'm gonna start by page rank here. Um, and let's, let's just see what we get. We're gonna do this again, same uh, uh, community detection here. We've got, we've created um, this query up here, which is in a language called Cypher. And Cypher is pretty similar to SQL. You'll find, you'll find that there's, um, you do these ASCII art things. So like the round parentheses mean a node. I can get square brackets, that means an edge, but whatever. Here are people um, sorted by their communities and their page ranks. So I can see that I've got a bunch of Starks, Rob, Rickon, Eddard, Catelyn, um, and they are all in the same community, but Sansa Stark isn't. And that's probably because as we remember from the books, she leaves those guys in the first book. So she's off doing her own thing. And then I've got Arya Stark here who has a different community, but again, she left. She's off doing her own thing, gallivanting around the countryside. So these communities make sense when you, when you look at how they came out. And again, I started this by page rank just to make it easier to understand. Okay, okay, cool. But what about machine learning? Now, Frequently when we have a graph, not all the time, but frequently we're talking about an unsupervised learning problem. We could get lucky. I could, you know, I could have run this saying, um, you know, of all these characters, Stark versus not a Stark. Um, or, you know, in the, persons in the North or not in the North. Okay, but for the sake of today, because we don't have a lot more time, um, I'm gonna show you just some quick unsupervised learning things that you can do. First, we have to create our embeddings though. That's the first step in any machine learning. So I'm using an algorithm here called FastRP. 
um, fast random projection. It's just a random walk. And we're going to walk around that weighted interaction graph. And I'm going to specify my edit, uh, embedding dimension here. So I'm just going to create a four dimensional vector um, for each of the each of the nodes within that weighted interactions graph. Okay, so, um, and I'm gonna write it out to a property called FRP emb, fast random projection embedding. Okay, so we're gonna run that. Okay, now let's look at what the embeddings were for some people ordered by page rank. And you can see I've got Tyrion Lannister and there's my four dimensional vector. I've got Tywin Lannister, another four dimensional vector. That's all, that all, Looks like it ran. Um, let's let's go now and look at what that means. Okay, what can we do with these embeddings? I'm gonna just do some normal machine learning tasks. Like again, I said, this is gonna be unsupervised machine learning, um, but we'll, I'll kind of give you a hint of where this can go for doing supervised machine learning. Okay, so let's do cosine similarity on two characters, Tywin Lannister and Jamie Lannister. So just like normal cosine similarity, I take their two vectors, their two embeddings, I compute the cosine between them, and I see that I have similarity here that's pretty high. You know, similarity of 1.0 being completely identical, similarity of zero being not so close at all. Um, and okay, so I see a high similarity between these two characters that I that we know. Um, now I'm going to pick one of these characters and somebody who I had absolutely no idea who they were. Um, so Harma, I think Harma might have been one of the Hill Tribes people. I don't actually remember. Um, and you can see Tywin Lannister has an incredibly small similarity when compared to this person that I have no idea who they are. Um, so the idea of using embeddings takes us back to the machine learning that we all know and we all love. Um, anything that you could do with a normal vector in machine learning, whether your favorite package is scikit-learn or Keras or whatever, anything that you can do with an embedding in that package, you can do with graph embeddings. So that takes us to the idea of um, you know, having supervised learning, being able to say um, node classification. I want to know is, is my node a person, a place, or a thing? Um, or, you know, link prediction. Is Tywin Lannister part of House Tyrell? Spoiler alert, no. But, um, but the idea of being able to do those classic machine learning problems um, just with these embeddings, you can do it in your own uh, preferred package, or it's, there's also some of these things that are built-in functions to Neo4j. I can't claim to know whether things like that are built into NetworkX, but again, being able to do it in a database, as you know from some of your larger data problems, generally helps, they're generally more scalable. Okay, so let's go back now to our Google Slides. Um, and I'm going to wrap things up here. Okay, first off, the links. Okay, you're going to want to go um, get this data science graph intro repo. Okay, that's that's on my GitHub. And for those of you who can't write that down fast enough, I'm going to try to leave this screen up for a while. Um, you can go and find me on Twitter. My Twitter handle is CJ Loves Data One. I think that's on my last slide here. And I've actually tweeted out the link to that first repo. The second repo is something that I didn't talk about too much, um, which is how I'm running this. A lot of data scientists we know like running things in Docker containers. This demonstration was no different. I was using Docker Compose to have two containers, one running the database and one running Jupyter Lab, and they're networked together. So that's how I was running that. Um, if you go to that link, it'll eventually get you to the repo where you can do that yourself. Um, I mentioned the Graph Data Science Library. There's a link to the, the API docs there. And then there's also this book here, Graph Algorithms. Um, hang on, I have it right here. It never leaves my side because it's really wonderful. Um, so Graph Algorithms is, um, it just kind of goes through everything and describes it, um, you know, describes all of these algorithms, how they work. Um, it's, a, it's a great resource put out by O'Reilly and it's actually available for a free download through that link. Um, and so I think that's my last side. There's my Twitter handle again. Um, you can just go and look at what my most recent tweet was. I think I automated it to come out within one minute from now, I believe. So, um, 
So you can go grab those repo links from there. Again, I wanna thank you for attending and sticking it out. And um, I, I guess at this point, the best way to take questions, um, Bill, do you think it's voice or is it um, in the chat? Um, I think uh, there's some questions in the chat and mm -hmm. uh, I think we can just go through them from the yeah. top. And, from the top. Uh, again, okay, I just quickly remind to, to everyone, uh, if you have questions, uh, please, uh, uh, feel free to post in the room chat. Uh, by the way, when you type in the chat, make sure you select to everyone so we can all see the messages, the questions, not just to, to the host. Yeah. Um, okay. If you prefer to speak to ask questions, uh, raise your hand uh, and uh, I will admit you to speak. Okay, I'm scrolling through to find the first question. Glad that everybody's introducing themselves, posting links here. How is Neo? Uh, machine learning different from ne neoclassical deep learning when pairing between inputs and groups. Um, so this is a question. Oh, this was a direct message. I'm sorry, this wasn't in uh, the full chat. So inputs and groups. I'm going to need a little more um, information here from you on this one, Arthur, if you're still on the phone or on the call. <laughs> sorry, I'm dating myself now. Um, so I'm uh, just going to talk um, in general terms about the, the machine learning that's built within the Neo4j versus what you can do with deep learning. Um, and it boils down to where do you want to do the calculation? So node classification, for instance, is a built-in machine learning function in Neo4j. So I can let Neo4j do that. I could also do that if I have the embeddings in my own deep learning function. So the, the key here is I've got to get embeddings. Now you could pull the entire graph down into Python without embeddings, and you can run your own embedding software on it. Um, there's uh, the group at Stanford, um, they are legendary at this. They're the ones who have invented a lot of these embedding algorithms. And you can run their stuff and it, it works pretty well. But running it in Python, as we all know, Python is not a compiled language. So therefore, Python can be pretty slow in doing this. So my view is, you know, in the case of Neo, let the, let the graph database do what it's good at. And it's good at calculating embeddings. So, um, so I would suck those embeddings down from Neo if you want to do your own pipeline or there's node classification and link prediction that, are, that exist within Neo already. Okay, let me go through. Um, let's see, what's the next question? I attended the NLP class. You know, there's a great to stay current. Oh, okay. Yes, NLP is a subject near and dear to my heart. Uh, okay, what channel on Slack? What is churn? Okay, churn is stop using the product. It can be even deleting your account. Um, let's see, what is MNIST? It looks like a lot of people were able to answer that one. Um, so let's see, scrolling through. Um, storm coming, not today, but I still have snow at my property. Um, let's see, I'm just, give me some time here. In supervised learning, what are the most common ways to featureize the graph data, embedding vectors or others? And okay, glad, this is a great question. And where have you seen good significant lift in performance from it? Okay, glad you asked this. So um, common ways, there's, there's two ways that you could um, come up with these features or you know, these vectors or embeddings, whatever you wanna call it. The first, you know, a lot of times we go and we get our own features, right? We say, okay, I've got these users and I want to know what dates did they uh, create their accounts and are they, um, what's their age? And you know, you can start assembling these features yourself and that works totally within a graph database, um, within graphs of any sort. The catch with that is think about how big I can make my embeddings. You know, I showed you a four dimensional vector. I could have limitless number of dimensions. Now, obviously that's not a good idea. You need to consider how many data points are within your data set. Um, so you wanna have fewer embeddings by a fair bit than what you have in your data set. So let's say I had enough data points to create a 128 dimensional vector. If you want to compete with um, the common ways to featureize data, then I have to come up with, you know, like 128 different uh, 
things, different columns that I'm going to bring into my table. So um, where have I seen good lift and performance from it? Um, this is a complicated question. And I'll tell you that people are still answering this question. But um, if you were to do something like go on to um, Medium, and there's a post out there, you're going to, I'm going to enter this guy's name in, uh, in the chat. His name is Christoph Nays. Okay. And Christoph wrote this great article where he looked at kind of one of the common graphs and it's called the Quora data set. It's looking at um, different cross references within a whole bunch of research articles. And what he was looking at, there's this deep learning uh, package called Graph Neural Networks by DGL, Deep Graph Learning. And what he was able to show was incredible, incredible accuracy, like shocking accuracy, just training on less than 140 no or 150, 140, 150 nodes within a graph, huge accuracy. So. Um, so yeah, I would definitely call that a significant lift in performance. Um, let's see, need help with using the repos, will you guys? Okay. Um, any mention of computer vision application using graph neural network? Yes, if you go into, um, if, if you grab this repo, go into the slides, there is, uh, it's not on the, it might be on the MNIST page, it might be on the, there, there's a link in there that shows people doing uh, imaging uh, image analysis with graphs. Um, if, if you Google it, there's some really great posts out there. Um, let's see, at the end, you did a variety of database manipulations, but I expected to see results as graphs because, of, uh, okay. Um, yeah, I could have shown these all as graphs. Um, you know, let me just quickly go back to my screen here. Um, and I have, uh, let's say I were to show, um, I'm going to match a person. I'm just going to do this really quick here. So forgive my horrible typing. Um, and I'm going to say that they have, what did I call it? Community ID something. Um, community maybe? Match um, community. Um, and I, if I remember correctly, 503 was a Stark. And um, they're going to be connected through, let's say, through Interacts. Now, this is probably, you know, the horrors of doing this live. And they're going to interact with some other person we're going to call P2. Um, and we're going to then return P and P2. And we're going to order by, uh, let's go P, but their page rank. Um, and we're going to say order by that descending. So I hope you can kind of see a little similarity. Now, watch, this is going to blow up just because that's my live luck. Um, P3, yes, because I put a typo in there. Sorry, you guys are getting to watch me fat finger this. Okay, uh, let's see, no changes in records. Okay, well, let me just get the people. Um, okay, and we're gonna say connected to um, H house. We're gonna return P and H order by P page rank descending. Let's see if that works. Okay, so, oh, yes. So this is great. I love typing. Well, you get to watch me screw up, but that was because I tried to say house was an edge by square brackets rather than a node by round brackets. Where'd it go? Okay, so here I can see I have a graph. Um, it will someday pop into existence. Sometimes these visualizations are kind of slow. Let me try to blow this up a bit. So, you know, I could start now filtering on, um, you know, I, I only grabbed the top page rank folks here um, because I only have 1,400 people who are being plotted here. I could say, I could limit this. Um, in fact, let me do that because this is going to turn into a mess real fast. Um, come on. Okay, let's say, let's get rid of this because sometimes those images could take up a fair bit of memory. I'm going to say, limit this to 20. Hits. Okay, and we're just going to go on that course. Um, 
Oh yeah, again, typos. Um, hopefully though, um, as I go through my various typos, you're getting the point here. Um, you know, and I could order this in any number of things that I calculate. Uh, no. Limit, okay. Again, I'm really sorry that you're watching me screw up my typing. Okay, let's see if there's connections between our top 20 and houses. And it looks like there will be once, um, once it renders fully. Um, sometimes the memory gets a bit bogged down in here and I just have to refresh browser. Um, okay, so let's, I lost my question window. So I'm going to stop sharing. Um, I'm gonna get my question window back. Okay, um, how is Neo uh, ML different? Okay, we answered that one already. Uh, Cora something. Uh, okay, research guy in Medium, can you please mention this again? Okay, so um, the research guy in Medium, is, his name is Christoph. And if you give me two seconds, I can probably actually drop the link in Slack to his presentation. Um, okay, this here, give me a sec. This is the starter post he has on using DGL. And he looks at um, several other deep learning algorithms um, in other posts. Um, oh, that's DeepMind's graph debt, sorry. DGL is his next post. So if you go look Christoph up, on Medium, what you will find is that post and um, his DGL post. And those are two great places to get started. Um, where is the post? Last name? Um, there you go. Somebody just posted that, uh, Christoph Nays. Okay, um, so are there any last questions? Because my window isn't scrolling any lower, so I assume that means uh, that was the last question. Uh, great. Yeah, I think uh, that's uh, all of the questions. Uh, but again, if uh, anybody have, we are a few minutes over time, but uh, that's fine. Uh, if anybody oh, have yes. last minute questions, uh, you uh, feel free to post in the chat. And also, I actually unmute uh, all of you. Uh, uh, you know, you can unmute yourself if you prefer to speak to us questions. I see all, the, all of you saying thank you. You're welcome and thank you all for attending. It's, it's really great, again, seeing so many people here who might be interested in graphs and so many different countries represented. So thank you. Great, great. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Claire, for the great presentations. Uh, I know these are online events, but I still want to give you a kind of like a, a visual applause, a round of applause. So for the folks still on the lines, if you uh, can turn on your cameras, if you want, or turn on, unmute yourself, uh, let's give Claire a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, everyone, for joining us. And uh, again, the session is recorded. Uh, you're going to get uh, emails uh, to the link uh, shortly after the session is done. Um, uh, with that, let's conclude today's event. Uh, please go to our website to check out uh, our, uh, you know, other events uh, coming.